with the computer. Keep your distance, but be reverent. Be very respectful of those who knew how to do it. But respect was in short supply. In the late 1960s, even computer engineers had a counterculture. They called it hacking. It was a radical approach to computers. Practical goals took second place to what hackers called the wild pleasure of exploration, a sentiment that phone freaks would recognize. Phone freaking was learning how to use a technology, how to uh, penetrate and, and utilize and expand the technology in ways that weren't generally available to the general public. In the same way, computer hacking is pushing the frontier, learning how to exploit computers and get them to do things that people said simply couldn't be done. For computer hackers to get their kicks, they had to get their hands on computers, which at the time was easier said than done. I had told my dad in my first year of college, someday I will own a 4K Nova computer. I said, Steve, it costs as much as a house. I said, then I'll live in an apartment. I'm going to have a computer someday in my life. When computers were vast number crunching machines costing $5 billion to develop, the idea of having your own computer, a personal computer, was inconceivable. Why would anyone want his or her own personal computer? That's ridiculous. It's like wanting your personal atom bomb or something like that. The bomb came in the shape of a new piece of kit called the Altair 8800. An article in a technical magazine appeared introducing the Altair, which was a computer kit that you could build. This so excited a couple of people in the Bay Area, they decided to form a club. Even before the, the pieces of these computers uh, were shipped out, uh, just to talk about them and share information about them. And they called it the Homebrew Computer Club. Thirty people eventually wound up uh, one night in March of 1975 to stand in a garage and look at this box. Among them was Steve Wozniak, and contained within this box was a network which would come to fascinate him even more than the telephone system. Sitting in a garage, rainy outside and dark, and the garage doors open to the outside darkness, and they started all talking about these computers going around. The Altair was pretty meaningless as a box. It came out, and once you put it together and flicked the switches, you got it to run, and then you said, well, gee, this is real nice, but what can I do with it? What they did with it was program it to play Daisy. Fifteen years earlier, computer engineers had coaxed the tune from a machine the size of a house. Now the hackers were doing it for themselves on a home-built kit computer. My interest from that first meeting just sprung up so strongly that every two weeks of my life, that was the most important thing I could do. The homebrew club quickly outgrew the garage. Computer hacking was catching on. Someone would stand up and say, I've got this problem. Anybody know how to solve this? Or, hey, you know that problem that was mentioned at Homebrew uh, two weeks ago? I found a solution to it. And it was, it was a phenomenal information exchange. I just passed out sets of schematics to anyone in the club that wanted them. I Xeroxed tons of copies because, hey, I felt kind of proud they'd be seeing my work. Lee Felsenstein, who became the moderator of the computer club, very consciously uh, set it up you know, as a hackerish enterprise. Total sharing of information. It didn't attract high-level people who have been successful in companies, business types. Didn't attract real engineers. The hard engineer would be blocked by his feeling that I have to have permission in order to do what's never been done before. We were there because we knew that we didn't need permission. Hackers set out to achieve the impossible, to build their own computers. It was the lure of, this was finally computer technology that you can actually have your hands on, you can actually control. Every time someone brought a computer, introduced a computer into the homebrew club, the first thing people would do is just rush up, take it apart, and learn everything about it, and just pester the designer with zillions of questions. You know, how does this work? Where's that, you know, uh, pin go to that pin? Uh, what kind of bus is this? Driven by their fascination for exploring technology, hackers didn't really care what their computers might actually do. Nobody had a practical reason why they wanted to have a personal computer. There were some excuses made up, like uh, balance your, your checkbook, uh, or uh, keep recipes, or control things around the house. 
but almost nobody ever did that. That's function guilt. That's, well, I mean, do you ask somebody, well, yes, but what can you do with your model train? No, I play with it. I enjoy it. It's fun to diddle with it. It's fun to experiment. But out of experimentation came genuine advances. My head started drifting and thinking and came up with a clever little trick that if I just took a bit of data and circled it around in a circle, it would, oddly enough, if I kept the timings exactly perfect and right, it would show up as color on a colored TV. It's my belief that the really important things we have on the computers came from the hackers. The homebrewers made computers do unthinkable things. They played games and music on them. They created graphics and drawing programs. At Homebrew, hacking was enjoying its golden age. Steve Wozniak labored day and night in his garage to produce his perfect computer. Woz, I believe, qualifies as the greatest all-around hacker. Uh, he could design the hardware, he could design the software right from the pencil and paper level uh, and make it go. If anybody ever looked at my circuit, they would start to see that, whoa, this guy doesn't just do straight designs like you're taught. He could see things that other people don't see and, you know, make connections that other people don't make. What I love about hackers is that they have a, a different maybe enhanced way of looking at the world to make those kinds of connections. Hackers would experiment with any hardware or software they could get their hands on, even if they didn't own it. But not everyone was into the idea of sharing. In 1976, the Homebrew Club received a stinging letter from another computer pioneer. As the majority of hobbyists must be aware, most of you steal your software. Who cares if the people who worked on it get paid? Most directly, the thing you do is theft. In what became a key moment in the history of the computer industry, Bill Gates wrote an angry letter to the homebrew people saying, wait a minute, I wrote this for money. You can't distribute this. This isn't free. This is work. Bill Gates' letter was a sign of things to come. Personal computers were about to become big business, as Steve Wozniak found out when his garage invention became the first Apple computer. In inventing the Apple I, he really didn't care about inventing a product. He just wanted a computer that would work the way he wanted it to, that had all the peculiarities to it and all the, all the design features in it that a computer hobbyist would like to have. Steve Jobs, his, his high school buddy, who didn't do the hardware or the software, said, oh, hey, you know, we could sell these things, and was as well, cool, man. Wozniak and Jobs' new company quickly followed the Apple I with the Apple II. Woz's hobby computer was transformed into the hottest consumer product around. The Apple II introduced the idea that it was completely in a plastic case like a hi-fi or a radio that you bought. You just take it home and turn it on and it starts working. Assembling the first apples by hand in Waz's bedroom, it had looked like a bit of a long shot. But the balance sheet at Apple soon told a different story. I got a phone call from Steve. And he said, guess what? I got a $50,000 order. When you're putting up a few hundred bucks each, wondering if you're getting your money back, and he says he's got a $50,000 order, it is such a huge shake in your world. What? By 1982, Apple sales had reached over half a billion dollars a year. But hacking and business were not compatible. The days of the homebrew computer club were numbered. Maybe I went to a few more homebrew meetings, but pretty much it started becoming not the big thing in my life. The big thing in my life started becoming more and more Apple Computer, the company. Now I had to put you know, more of my full-time energy into things that were going into products being sold. With companies like Apple, uh, forming and becoming serious businesses, uh, secrets b became introduced into it. You couldn't tell your colleagues in the Homebrew Computer Club what your product plans were, what you were working on, because uh, you know competitors might be there and they would you know say, oh, you know, Apple's doing that. You know, let's, let's get a similar project going ourselves. I think it ultimately led to the end of Homebrew. <laughs> The Homebrew Computer Club met for the last time in 1986, leaving behind not just Apple, but 23 computer companies founded by its members. Hackers could claim to have created the modern world, 
but it was a world in which they would no longer be welcome. On February 15, 1995, a two-year manhunt ended when armed FBI agents tracked down a wanted criminal to an apartment building in North Carolina. Hacking was about to become an outlaw profession. FBI, come to the door. I have a warrant for your arrest. About 1.30 in the morning, a knock comes on my door. And I didn't look at the clock, because if I looked at the clock, I wouldn't have even answered. Well, who is it? And they said, FBI. The FBI had come for Kevin Mitnick, a 32-year-old hacker whose intrusion into other people's computers